looks like audio is up and running. There we go. Okay, we've got a handful of folks watching. Welcome to everyone who has made time in their schedules to uh, listen to me natter on for a while about uh, the history of nuns in America. I've got 30 pages of notes, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let me go to my console page here. All right, so uh, my name is Rebecca Brothers. I am a librarian at the UAH uh, Salman Library, specifically the Research and Instructional Services Librarian. Uh, this is the first of our refined research presentations this semester, which is basically where librarians get to geek out for a while about their niche research interests. My niche re research interest that I'm presenting on today is nuns, specifically American nuns. There used to be a lot more of them in the US than there are now. There used to be about four and a half times as many uh, just a few decades ago, really. They used to be everywhere. They used to do everything. They used to be nurses. They used to be uh, omnipresent in schools. They used to be doing social work and out and about in poor neighborhoods. They used to be assisting in churches. They just seemed to be everywhere just a few decades ago. So what happened? Where did they all go? And what are today's nuns doing? Let me advance my slides here. All right. So this is a brief portrait of the landscape of American nuns, um, starting all the way back in nine, or in 1727, rather, which is where the history of nuns in America begins. A quick note about terminology, uh, the catch-all term for both nuns and sisters is women religious. We'll look at that difference later uh, between nuns and sisters. I want to draw your attention not only to what happened after 1965 in this graph, that, that not so slow, uh, steady decline in the number of Catholic women religious in the US, but also to understand what happened after that peak, you really have to understand what led up to that peak and look at just what led to that sharp spike in Catholic women religious in the US leading up to 1965. Uh, so, a bit of terminology, nuns 101, if you will. The difference between uh, nuns and sisters, there is a difference. I will not be too pedantic about that difference in today's lecture. I'll be using the term uh, sister, the term nun, and the term women religious pretty interchangeably. Uh, but there is a difference, if you're curious. Uh, often the two groups take identical vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. But sisters, technically speaking, are women who live out those vows in the world. They're working as teachers, nurses, social workers, lawyers, doctors, etc. Uh, the term nun technically is reserved for women who live out their vows in a cloistered setting. Every place where women religious live, whether that's called a convent, an abbey, a monastery, a community, something else, every one of those places has a cloister. Uh, which is the physical space where non-nuns are not allowed to go. But for cloistered women religious, the cloister is more than just the dormitories and the refectory, which is the dining hall. It can be the entire convent with very obvious physical barriers between the nuns and the outside world. It's not uncommon uh, to see something like in that picture down the bottom of the slide here. Uh, for there to be a visitor's parlor with a metal grill down the middle, like you see in that photo. And when the nun's family has come to visit them, uh, their families will come in to the parlor on, from the outside world, from that outside door, and they'll sit on one side of that grill, and the nun will sit on the other side of the grill, in the cloistered side of the grill, and they'll just visit through the grill. <laughs> uh, in some cloistered monasteries, there's a piece of furniture called a turn, which is the other photo you see there on the left-hand side, which is designed to let in mail and groceries and other necessities. Uh, it's designed to let them pass through into the cloister without the person making the deliveries seeing the nun whose job it is to work the turn. For some cloistered abbeys, if they have any sort of online presence, which is not a given, uh, they might have a policy not to show nuns' faces or to give their names. They might refer to them only by their initials. Uh, sometimes there will be one or two senior nuns whose job it is to answer the phone. 
sometimes there will be a lay employee whose job it is to do that so that the nuns don't even have that much contact with the outside world. Uh, again, there are no hard and fast rules about this is always done, that is always done. Uh, it really varies from order to order and convent to convent how the rules of enclosure are observed. My next slide here, let's advance this. So how does one become a nun? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, it's a question that was on my heart for many, many years as I pondered whether this was a path uh, that I was on. Spoiler alert, it was not, which is why I am broadcasting from my office today in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, but the process I'll describe here may vary a bit depending on specific convents, specific eras in history. On the whole, the, the process has stayed pretty consistent. So level zero, you are known as an aspirant or a seeker or a searcher or something similar. Uh, that would describe the girls in the front of this photo here with their hair uncovered. At this level, you are looking at several different convents. You're kind of feeling out where you fit best, discerning whether or not this is your path at all. You're spending time at different convents, maybe only a weekend at a time, maybe several months at a time. At the next level, you are a postulant. Um, if you've watched The Sound of Music, I believe this is the uh, this is the stage that Marie is at when we first meet her, uh, if you're keeping track of, you know, nun accuracy in movies, which is a dangerous path to go down. <laughs> this way lies madness. Uh, but at this level, you've applied to a specific convent for residency. You might be issued a specific simple habit or outfit when you arrive for your postulancy. Or you might be asked to supply your own simple uniform, like a plain white button-down shirt and a black skirt. Uh, you are now living at the convent full-time, day in, day out. You're learning the ins and outs of nun life. And this stage lasts anywhere from six months to two years, depending on the order. There we go. This stage also formally begins in some orders um, with the postulant kneeling at the, the cloister door and formally petitioning for entry. In this picture here, you can kind of get a sense of how big a deal this is, how big of a step this is, um, because you can see their, uh, the postulant's family are all gathered outside the cloister. They're watching her take this step um, symbolically away from them and into this new life. So postulancy is your next step there. Uh, level two, you are a novice. The novitiate lasts about two to three years, depending on the order, once again. Uh, novices' habits are going to more closely mirror those of the sisters who have been there longer. And the novitiate traditionally begins in many orders with a ceremony called investiture or clothing day or the reception of the habit or the receiving of the habit, something similar. Um, in some orders, and again, this is more common historically than now, but it began with postulants processing down the aisle of the church or the chapel in wedding dresses. Um, and then eventually they would have their hair cut very, very short, or sometimes have their head shaved at the beginning, at the front of the church, rather. Uh, they are then robed in novices' habits and receive their religious names. I am often asked, uh, do sisters get to choose their own names? And, you know, sister so-and-so, sister Mary Catherine so-and-so. Uh, the answer, as always, is it depends. Let me move my little webcam thing away. There we go. Marvelous. You can see more of the picture there. Um, in some orders, and again, this will change over, you know, throughout history and depending on the order. In some orders, you are allowed to, to, to choose your own religious name. In some, you submit a list of three or four names you would like uh, to your superior. In some, the superior has full control over what your religious name is going to be and what you will be known as uh, in the rest of your religious life. So that's the novitiate. Next up is going to be junior professed sisters. Uh, these are also called temporary professed sisters. They make temporary vows at this stage. Uh, usually they are made annually for three to five years. And sisters entering the juniorate will sometimes get a new color of veil. Usually they will swap out the white veil of the novitiate for a black, blue, or dark brown veil, depending on their order's habit. That is the junior professed sister. That is the longest stage, uh, at least before level four, which is a solemn professed sister. 
a nun I know refers to this as getting tenure as a nun. So these are the life vows. Some orders require sisters to spend a period of time in vigil before the altar, uh, either before or right after they take their life vows. You can see this on the left-hand side there. Uh, sometimes stretched out flat on their faces, covered in uh, either a sheet or their own uh, cloaks, sprinkled in flower petals. The one on the left there is lying prostrate on a cross of flowers. Uh, sisters who have, uh, I can't think of any other way to say it except they've they have passed this step, they've passed this test. Uh, sisters at this stage are considered fully fledged members of their communities. Often they will then have full voting powers in community matters if their order is governed by a council. Uh, and sometimes they receive a wedding ring to signify their marriage with Christ. So that is level four, tenure as a nun. So how long have nuns been in the US? Almost 300 years, coming up on 300 years in five years time actually. Uh, so back in 1727, the first record of nuns in America pops up with a group of French Ursuline sisters opening a girls school in New Orleans. And that is a picture of their school building uh, there, which was built only a couple decades after they started their school, I think in the 1740s. Then in 1790, the Carmelite sisters opened their first American school over in Maryland. The Visitandines follow in 1816 with a school in Virginia. And then the Dominicans follow suit in 1822 in Kentucky. Uh, by the way, these are all uh, nuns. They're just kind of different flavors of nuns, so different orders of nuns. They have different founders. They might have slightly different uh, vows that they follow or additional vows that they take. Uh, their rule of life, uh, so the um, the way they order their days and uh, the reason that they exist is going to vary according to their order, but they're all, they're all sisters. There we go. So next up, we have our first American order of nuns founded. That would be the Sisters of Charity of St. Joseph in 1810 by Elizabeth Ann Seton. This same order founded the first hospital west of the Mississippi. Uh, they had, in their first years, they had these broad, white, starched headdresses that you can see on the right-hand side there, um, which led to the nickname of God's Geese. They were often called God's Geese as they went about their hospital and teaching and social work duties. So, First American Order, 1810. Only 26 years later, you find a report to the Vatican that noted that Catholic women's communities only in the Baltimore Diocese, so just in that little area, uh, there, there were about 40 groups of nuns and sisters in 16 or 17 establishments, just in that little area. And then over the next 90 years, from 1866 to 1926, the U.S. saw nearly 500 hospitals open under nuns direction. Many of the nuns who ran and opened those hospitals had been educated at convent run nursing schools and graduates of those schools were also highly in demand at the Catholic nursing homes that served America's oldest residents. Then in 1952 Pope Pius XII issues a call to renewal in which he lauds the religious life, religious vocations, as the highest calling for girls. This really sparked a renewal, as he intended. <laughs> uh, over the next 10 years, over 15,000 young women, many of them fresh out of high school, were admitted as postulants to various convents. Uh, and if they entered active orders, they could be assured of universities training, which was especially alluring for lower class girls who might not otherwise have been able to attend college. Support for these new postulants decisions was widespread. There was a sister of St. Joseph who entered convent life in 1958. She recalled that hundreds upon hundreds of people turned out to send her and 24 other girls off in style. There was a Holy Cross nun near Chicago named Sister Carol Jakofsky who wrote a memoir which is absolutely fantastic and fun. She recalled that when she was admitted to the novitiate in 1965, the solemn procession to the church on reception day felt more like a parade. She writes, when I spotted my high school pals, I lost control, smiling and waving like a prom queen. Reception day was a high holy feast day and we were the stars of the show. So really in this kind of golden age of American young women entering convents, you can see how 
widespread and and fervent the support for their decisions were. Uh, there were such things known as vocation books, uh, which were officially sanctioned texts targeted at girls and their families, describing the rewards and challenges of convent life. On the left-hand side there, you can see one of the most popular, which is called Bernie Becomes a Nun. Uh, it mingled pictures and prose to describe how the real-life Sister Bernadette Lynch found happiness as a Mary Knoll nun, uh, who later spent many, many years as a missionary Mary Knoller in South America. The narrator in this book says, Goodbye to all your friends, but not as though you were going off to the Bastille. On the contrary, God is beckoning you to a very full, vibrant life with him. A hard life, of course, but what fun is there in riding to heaven in a Cadillac? There were also books like the one on the right-hand side, uh, which I refer to as a, a bird book for nuns, <laughs> uh, McCarthy's Guides to the Catholic Sisterhood in the United States. Uh, they gave each order, whether it's the Mary Nollers or the Carmelites or the Visitandines, every order in those books got a one-page summary and a picture of a habited nun. So you could kind of use it like a bird book where if you saw a nun on the street, you could be like, okay, uh, black habit, white wimple, okay, yeah, she's a Benedictine. Uh, in short, American Catholic girls in the 1950s and early 1960s, the, that 10 year period, uh, had plenty of encouragement to choose a religious vocation and lots of support and information as they made that choice. Inevitably, uh, communal life had its challenges and still does if you ask <laughs> any nuns around the country. Not all superiors were jovial and understanding like Mother Abbess from The Sound of Music. By tradition, superiors had unlimited power over their sisters' food, schedules, and leisure time activities, and this power could easily be taken to an extreme. One Sacred Heart superior instructed her nuns to fail tests in their college courses so that someone else would feel successful. Another superior of the Sisters of St. Joseph called out one of her nuns for walking too fast, and to train her to walk more slowly, she made the nun drag a quacking toy duck behind her for a week. These restrictions were supposed to instill humility and devotion and obedience, but they often left nuns feeling humiliated and rebellious. If you were a working sister, working as a teacher or a nurse or whatnot, they often found that they were expected to finish their degrees mainly by taking summer courses. This was a schedule that a lot of them wryly called the 20 year plan. The habits that nuns wore, which were long held up as one of these most visible symbols of nunhood, turned out to be less than ideal. Uh, those floor length skirts were easily tripped on if you were a, a sister in a warm, climate, uh, if your habit was made of wool, which it, they often were, those were very unpractical in the hot weather. Uh, those tight wimples sometimes caused ear infections, and it, in at least one case, those wide veils of the type that you can see here, uh, one of those obstructed a, nun, a nun's vision as she was driving, causing a fatal collision. Another source of rebellion in convents was the male hierarchy that dominated convent life. Long accustomed to doing most of the church's practical on the ground work, nuns were growing weary of being treated like second class Catholics. So in the mid, 20, uh, mid 20th century, a priest in New Jersey entered a nun's classroom and he said, I would like to see the students' mass attendance records, please. And the nun said, no, <laughs> that is their own matter of personal conscience. Uh, you don't have a right to see that. And the priest escalated it to the principal, who was a fellow nun. The principal defended the teacher. Uh, the priest escalated it to the bishop. And the bishop said, uh, hey, uh, to the principal, hey, I, I need you to side with the priest to uphold his manhood. And it was incidents like these, uh, as well as contemporary world events showing the dangers of absolute authority and obeying that unquestioningly that convinced increasing numbers of nuns to take control of their own fates in one way or another. The first major call for reform came, let me move my picture again, there we go. So the first major call for reform came in 1954, uh, which is earlier than I expected. A sister named Sister Mary Emile Panay addressed the National Catholic Educational Association saying, we have never looked upon our sisters as a human resource to be used to the utmost intellectual capacity of each one, which is a little like saying that we have been thinking that sisters are expendable. 
So both with this call to renewal from Pope uh, Pius XII in 1952, and also remember in 1954, some of those early baby boomers were starting to flood into parochial schools. So this speech marked the beginning of the Sister Formation Conference, also known as the F SFC, which was an organization, organization dedicated to the educational and spiritual rights of all American nuns. Under the SFC's influence, women religious began to complete their training, not in the 20 year plan, but well under 20 years after entering the convent. Uh, they were also not assigned to their positions as teachers or nurses or whatnot until after they had finished their training. And, pardon me, they were given more theological, emotional, and psychological support as they pursued their uh, careers. And then, just a few short years away in 1962, what happens but the Second Vatican, Vatican Council. Uh, op it opened in October of 1962, closed three years later, December 1965. Uh, Vatican II was a big deal. It involved enormous amounts of people. This is uh, one picture of one gathering uh, from Life magazine in, I believe, St. Peter's Square. I could be wrong. Um, but there were four sessions of this council that occurred, and they aimed for, uh, number one, a spiritual renewal and reinvigoration of the church that would make it more faithful to Christ's will. Number two, an updating of its pastoral attitudes, habits, and institutions to make them more effective in the changed conditions of the modern world. And number three, the restoration of unity among Christians. So there were 16 pronouncements uh, that came out of uh, the Second Vatican Council. There were 3,058 clerics involved. And of these 16 pronouncements, none were of more interest to pro-reform nuns than the degree on the up-to-date renewal of religious life. This was also called Perfecti Caritatis, and it included this exhortation on the screen. The manner of living, praying, and working should be suitably adapted everywhere, but especially in mission territories, to the modern physical and psychological circumstances of the members, and also, as required by the nature of each institute, to the ne necessities of the apostolate, the demands of culture, and social and economic circumstances. According to the same criteria, let the manner of governing the institutes also be examined. Therefore, let constitutions, directories, custom books, books of prayers and ceremonies and such like be suitably re-edited and obsolete laws being suppressed be adapted to the decrees of this sacred synod. So in that decree, you can see kind of the shadows of the end of Attila the Nun as uh, overbearing superiors were often known. There were uh, there was also an exhortation based on religious habits, which is our next slide here. So, uh, again, of interest to pro-reform nuns, the religious habit and outward mark of consecration to God should be simple and modest, poor and at the same becoming. In addition, it must meet the requirements of health and be suited to the circumstances of time and place and to the needs of the ministry involved. The habits of both men and women religious, which do not conform to these norms, must be changed. So no more wool habits in Ecuador is what I read out of that. <laughs> With such clear support for reform, and especially from a papal council, prominent nuns decided to put aside uh, their relative demotion to second-class Catholics and focus their energy on reforms of hierarchy and habits. Hierarchical reform, as first begun by the SFC a decade earlier, was revived just days after the last session of Vatican II in December of 1965. Sister Mary Luke Tobin, the American superior of the Sisters of Loretto and president of the Conference of Major Superiors of Women, uh, which is the, long story short, is the organization that took the place of the SFC uh, just a few years after the SFC was uh, founded. Uh, but Sir, Sister Mary Lou Tobin spoke up for a more democratic convent structure, saying that superiors had too much power. She said that new American nuns had grown up in a society marked by an appreciation for individual rights, and convents would have to learn to respect that or else risk dying out entirely. 
Many convents responded positive, positively to this change. Uh, Sister J Carol Joukowsky, the uh, Holy Cross nun that I mentioned earlier near Chicago, who had the great memoir, has the great memoir. Uh, she was part of a movement at her convent, which was a, an, an order of teaching sisters. Uh, her convent realized that all of the n younger nuns with their full class loads at the nearby college um, would have to, they, they might appreciate having a more relaxed schedule, especially a more relaxed schedule uh, as pertains to the mass schedule. So many of them chose to change the previously strict schedule of 5 a.m. Reveille and 9 p.m. Lights Out uh, into a, uh, a schedule where they would sleep in in the morning and uh, go to mass maybe at night or even just once a week. Uh, the local convent was not pleased about this, but they let the genie out of the bottle. So they're like, well, I guess our, our, our nuns are choosing their own schedules now. Uh, they were also allowed at this particular convent near Chicago to divide themselves into groups and plan their own meals instead of relying on one central convent kitchen to plan the meals for the whole convent. Uh, on one occasion, Sister Dukovsky's group decided that their meal for the night would be pizza delivered from a local restaurant. So, of course, you know, it's, it's night, uh, it's very quiet at the convent, everyone is, is studying or, or at prayers, and the pizza delivery van pulls up in front of the convent with a speaker on the top of the van that's blasting that samore. And the superior was not pleased. Uh, she met it with arms folded and furrowed brow. This is not what we had in mind for the cooking group, she said. But, uh, as previously mentioned, and as Sister Joukowsky noted, going back to those old ways of one central dining room and a rigorous schedule for everyone would have been not feasible at that point. Once you've let people have that degree of freedom and choice, uh, eh, they're not going back. <laughs> so by the 1990s, actually, uh, many orders had phased out that old top-down hierarchy uh, and were now governed by a council and a president. Changes in sisters' clothing was perhaps the most contentious modification, which uh, and it began even before Vatican II had ended. Uh, this slide here is, which let me move my picture down here. Boop, there we go. Uh, so this slide here is of the same convent uh, over a period of maybe 80 years, 80 to 100 years. So they started out, of course, with a very traditional habit, as seen on the left-hand side there, wimple, veil, etc. And then in November 1964, two sisters from this order, uh, the Ursuline sisters in Oklahoma City, appeared in this modified habit that you see in the middle. Uh, gone were the white wimples and the floor-length black skirts. In their place, Sister Immaculata and Sister Stephen wore a black skirt, white blouse, bla black waistcoat, which is a vest, with the Ursuline insignia and a white ribbon to tie back their hair. The local newspaper had a blast with this, as you can see. Uh, they quoted Sister Immaculata saying, I feel like I've been freed and let out of armor. The new habit that you see here in the middle was rejected by a, a cardinal. Uh, he was not pleased about this. He was the Vatican official in charge of religious communities, Cardinal Ildebrando Antoniotti, sorry, Antoniotti my Italian is terrible. Uh, he was not pleased, he rejected this. He said it's not nun-like. Uh, so the sisters said, all right, you don't like this habit, we will choose a new one. And they chose an even less conservative outfit. Uh, and within 10 years of that change, so by the mid 70s, sisters were able to choose a dress within a range of colors and styles with or without a simple veil. By that time, the Ursulines had long since stopped asking Rome's opinion. And then, of course, on the right-hand side here, this is what the Ursulines from that same convent uh, look like today. That's what they wear today. Um, they have their very nice suits. Some of them appear to their uh, jobs in, you know, jeans and T-shirts, and you could not pick them off the street as nuns. Uh, but they are wearing what they want, and they are wearing what is suited to their jobs and their desires. And I dare say that is what Vatican II's decree uh was going for. So let's go to the next slide here. But in the meantime, Rome was not too excited about this. 
um, Cardinal Antoniuti cautioned against nuns in subordination shortly after Vatican II. He said that radical feminism has smothered women's natural instincts toward humble and retired self-growing, uh, which would define the Vatican's actions toward progressive nuns for decades to come. One example of this, a rather grim story out of 1968, there was a convent in Los Angeles known as the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, or IHM. They attempted to determine their own course of renewal, which included modifying their habit. Uh, a local cardinal, uh, James McIntyre, summoned a Vatican investigator, which summarily told the IHM sisters to revert back to their old habits and submit to his authority. And after hearing that, about 90% of the sisters refused and were dismissed from the order. Just boop, out, out of the convent, leave. But most marched straight back to the community chapel to retake their vows in silence, forming an independent group of IHM sisters that remained outside the church for another 30 years until 1995. That incident, uh, which went viral uh, in its own way for that time, made the stakes very clear to convents in the US. Orders who wished to reform would have to do so very carefully. As a result, there was a glacial pace of, ref of reform and many nuns chose to leave their orders rather than uh, submit to that very, very slow pace of, ref of reforms. Sis Sister Dukovsky writes, in 1972, the summer of our final profession, seven were left out of the 50 who had entered the Sisters of the Holy Cross with me in 1964. This is sometimes called the bleeding of the sisterhood and it occurred at a similar rate across the nation in the 1960s and 70s. From 1966, the year after Vatican II ended, to 1976, over 50,000 sisters left their orders, dropping the country's numbers to 130,000 and change. Most of these sisters left in order to pursue the religious life to which they had felt called in the beginning. Some because the reforms were coming about too slowly, uh, and others, of course, because the reforms were happening at all and they didn't see a need for change. Today, there are about 44,000 sisters in the US, which is about the same number of sisters as there were in the US uh, before that sharp spike up to 1965 happened, really. There are uh, about 90% of those are over the age of 60, but age has not stopped many of them from continuing the renewal process. In 2008, the Vatican began an investigation of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, an organization may, making up about 80% of America's nuns. The investigation concluded in 2012 when papal authorities placed the LCWR under three bishops' controls, control for five years. They were saying that this organization was spreading, quote, certain radical feminist themes incompatible with the Catholic faith and neglecting traditional social issues such as opposition to abortion and gay marriage. Many sisters were unabashedly supporting women's ordination and looser rulings on birth control, but at the same time, they would disagree that these teachings were incompatible with the Catholic faith. There was one nun who said something summarizing the LCWR's view that I really liked, and she said, our vow of obedience applies to God. It doesn't reside in a bishop, a body of bishops, or even the Pope. In short, when we made these vows, we made them to God. We did not make them uh, to man. Uh, this statement, as you can imagine, did not win the many supporters in the Vatican. But what will American convents look like in 10 years? Given their advancing average age, they will probably continue to fade from schools and hospitals. Uh, in 2007, the average American Catholic school staff was only 4.4% men and women religious. That percentage will probably continue to fall. Uh, the number of new postulants per year doesn't paint a rosy picture either, at least for progressive congregations. Uh, in 2012, a Jesuit newspaper reported that LCWR religious orders in the U.S. had about 500 women in various stages of becoming vowed sisters with a retention rate of only about 50%. So assuming that there is more than one of you entering a convent in the same year, if there are two of you entering that convent in the same year, you look at each other and you know, on average, one of you will leave before taking uh, your, your final vows. 
Traditional habit order, uh, habit wearing orders are doing better though, uh, possibly because habits, strict schedules, and communal life are appealingly traditional. There is a habit wearing Dominican convent up in Nashville that's dear to my heart. It is one success story. Uh, in 2007, it reported that it had 226 members total. It had a median age of 35 and an average of 12 new postulants per year. I will also note um, regarding their average age, they do have an age limit for, you know, you can't be above age, I think 30 when you start uh, pursuing uh, a vocation with them. So that might contribute to their low average age. They also expanded to a new $60 million facility in the last decade. So they're doing pretty well up there in Nashville. Meanwhile, the media profiles of sisters living out their vows in various ways continues to intrigue and delight the world. There is sister Helen, I don't know how to say her last name, Prejean, Prejean um, who has made a name for herself through her advocacy work uh, for the end of the death penalty in America and for her work counseling prisoners on death row. In the middle there is sister Claire Crockett. Uh, she had a story where, uh, a life story where she used to be quite a party girl uh, and then she uh, heard the call to become a nun. And that story touched innumerable hearts, especially when her commitment to her vows led to her untimely death at age 33. And on the right, there is Sister Ardeth Platt, uh, whose protests against nuclear prolif prol proliferation led to her imprisonment for many years. Uh, and if this sounds familiar, it is because she inspired a character on Orange is the New Black named Sister Jane Ingalls. Uh, if you get a chance, look up Sister Ardeth Platt's uh, protest techniques against nuclear prolifer pr lordy, proliferation. Uh, they are very metal. Uh, she really knew how to make a statement. Uh, but in short, America may not have nearly as many nuns as it did in the 1960s, but we do still have them. They do still walk among us, uh, living out their vows in effervescent and creative ways. They continue to be uh, a colorful part of the American landscape. And you know, all things considering, I think they'll be with us for decades to come. So thank you very much for attending.